Good day, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's edition of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajawara in New York City. Brian Moynihan is with me today. He is the chair of the board and CEO of Bank of America. Brian joined the family in 1993 as a deputy general counsel of what was then Fleet Boston. Following the merger with Bank of America, he became president of Global Wealth and Investment Management, followed by CEO of Merrill Lynch in 2008, and ultimately CEO of Bank of America in 2010. The company he leads today, with a history dating back to 1784 and the founding of Massachusetts Bank, has some 210,000 employees around the world, was named 2023 World's Best Bank by Global Finance, America's Most Just Company and Top Company for Workers by Just Capital, to Forbes' Top Female-Friendly Companies and World's Best Employer lists, and Fortune's Best Companies to Work For and Most Admired Companies lists, among many other accolades. Brian joins me today in no small part due to the efforts of his colleagues, Larry Dorita and Jessica Oppenheim and her staff. So Brian, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a privilege to have you here and it's, it's good to see you again. Uh, it's great to be here and our, our firms have done business together for many years and so it's uh, good to be here and have a chance to talk. Really appreciate it. I wanted to maybe start with some, some still recent history yeah. a little bit. Obviously, um, every year, everything that's going on, and you know this momentous year in front of you, but every year, global leadership sort of resets in Davos. My understanding is basically you've been to Davos every year since you became CEO. And um, the world's leaders, business leaders, political leaders, NGO leaders, and the like all kind of gather. And I just wanted to get your, your impressions coming out of it this year, kind of contextualized with everything you've seen in the past. But what was the mood? What did you pick up? What's on everybody's mind? Well, I think you know, first you have to set the setting, which is you know three to four thousand people actually there, but also tens of thousands of people surrounding them. So it's a it's a busy month and a half in five days um, in terms of activity uh, for all of us. But you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the keys there. The, you know, obviously, President Zelensky was there, and it was a lot about how to continue to support Ukraine uh, in their efforts. And it, we had a congressional delegation there from the United States. You had leaders from all other countries and the discussion is okay whether Europe's uh, funds or US funds need to get those through and uh, you know a compelling case by the Ukraine that you know we're here to fight and make the stand for Western democracy and for the right thing and all you need to do is fund us and we'll keep going and, right. and so it's a pretty clear uh, take then this year you had the added issues in the Middle East with you know the attack of Hamas on Israel and Israel's response. And so there you have you know, countries from the region and you know, discussion about how, you know, how do we get this? Is there any solution here? And that's, that was interesting. And then you have the usual uh, European US dialogue about you know, things as, uh, uh, as ranging from you know, uh, the IRA as being a good or bad, depending on where you're sure. at. You had China was there, well represented there, including the premier and talked to a bunch of us and gave a speech and talked about China being open. Um, you had you know, the environmental work was there as much as people said it wasn't there. The, the, all the regular environmental tasks went on, which is kind of interesting because it, it means that the private sector is heavily engaged as part of business as usual. We did some work on anti-Semitism with the second gentleman, and there was a they were on the Davos stage with the uh, first uh, lady of Israel, the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, and talking about anti-Semitism and anti-hate and. and you know, so the, it's just a range of things. But I'd say the economy in the U.S. is the envy of the world. Uh, outside the world, you know, things are still working their way through the system. India's strong, this one, that. You know, we have all that dialogue. But I think, you know, really, and then the major issue, which, you know, is, you know what's going to happen in all these elections? And, and, and every acts like they're surprised. They come up every four years in the United States. They come up every five years in certain countries. And everybody's sitting there saying, like, oh, my gosh, these elections are coming. And saying, you know, this has happened before. So there's a lot of discussion about them. But at the end of the day, you know, people are trying to figure out, you know, what happens if X happens or Y happens or Z happens. So if media reports are to be believed, sort of the big topic of the uh, of the week was artificial intelligence yeah. this year. Uh, and of course, um, Anthony Scaramucci, who uh, is a well-known man about town up in Davos, made some headlines by talking about, well, the number one reason why Trump won't be reelected is that everybody up here thinks he, he thinks he will be. Now, putting Trump aside for a second, 
he was getting at the almost cliche yeah, yeah. that the Davos consensus is so often wrong right. on things like, you know, would Russia invade Ukraine, yeah. how bad the pandemic was going to be, Trump in 2016 for that matter. Yeah. So, you know, as you think about what you were hearing and what was on the minds of everybody, especially because Trump, if that if that happens, that's a 2025 story. AI is going to play out for yeah. the next decade plus. But when you look at this year and what you're worrying about yeah. right now, did you think, my gosh, there there's some blind spots here in Davos. So they're missing a couple of things. Well, first of all, it, artificial intelligence already replaced me. That's why I didn't think about it before, because, uh, yeah, they, it's on everybody's mind. And, and, you know, there was lots, you know, the part of the promenade that was, you know, that they buy out the storefronts is all about artificial intelligence. Yeah. And so the, the, the theme of artificial intelligence. The crypto places from last year, yeah, right? <laughs> but it's that's not new, honestly. It, you know, seven or eight years ago, we were talking about artificial intelligence at Davos. What's happened is ChatGPT sort of changed the familiarity with it and the speed of it. Um, you know, the things that could go right or wrong, which is part of the dialogue there, is, is you know, at the end of the day, you have two, as the military call them kinetic wars, you know, and the, could they go in a very different path? Would you block and block trading routes? Uh, you've seen that happen in the Middle East already. Yeah. The Black Sea has remained open, therefore the Ukrainian economy is going, but that could change. That's uh, so the Tai uh, you know, Taiwan, US, China situation going in that place. And so those are all the things that can happen. And and when you think about it, you know, the CEOs are sitting and say, okay, how do I think about all that? And the more uncertainty, the more they slow down. And, and in fact, that's why some of the aspects of the world are slowing down is that people are being more careful. Rates went up, slowed down, uh, increased the cost of doing something because borrowing money and, 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 and capital. Um, and then on top of that, more uncertainty. So you've seen a slowdown. But, but I think you know, there wasn't a lot of unexpected outcomes that you know, people hadn't thought about before. It's just the question. Some people think things are absolute truths going to happen, right? Even though they're in the future, right? And it should be could, not did. Um, but they think that way versus other people are saying, you know, these are all possibilities, and we'll plan to, uh, you know, plan one way or the other way, and you know, we've got to be ready. And that's what the private sector does. We have to adopt the situation. We don't get to control political outcomes. We don't get to control what happens in a war, but we have to be ready to deal deal with it and react to it and move. And that's how you have to keep the companies balanced and keep your operations balanced and keep your supply chain balanced and all that. So when you when you put all that together, even with the the amount of pre-work that you do and the consideration that you give onto these types of issues, and you just listed the sort of the momentous year we've got ahead of us, we've got two hot wars going on that can yeah. kind of go in different ways with different ramifications for the global economy. You've got half the world's adult population voting with yeah. the most momentous election later this year in the US. You've got the Fed about to perhaps uh, start its easing cycle. Um, you've got the presidents of China and the United States trying to put a floor and maintain a stable relationship um, uh, between these two countries. And then there's something going on that I think a lot of analysts haven't quite yet figured out in places like Iran and North Korea right now. So when you when you think about that, but also in the context of the work you and your colleagues are doing, what do you feel like you've got good line of sight on and on these sort of variables? Where, where you know, what's kind of keeping you up at night? All those things keep yeah. up at night. Um, uh, and because all of them could happen. All of them could send directions. At the end of the day, if you're in a financial services or if you're in a business, it's, it's how it's going to impact the economy. So if you have uh, uh, escalation of, of war, you know, what happened to Ukraine, uh, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, uh, the repositioning, gas prices, oil prices move, that affects the economy. So it, it, ultimately, it's going to affect the economy. If, if uh, One of the questions that we were talking about, even before Davos and Davos, is how much of the repositioning of economies have to go for the war efforts? Because the end of the day, the war is being fought. We may not be sending uh, uh, men and women to the front, but we're right. sending the, the munitions, and other countries are too. And you know that has an impact of moving part of the economy from here to there, or else it, you can't get the goods produced. So there, there's a lot of impacts like that. So they're all possibilities, and you plan for them. But you know, at the end of the day, the way we think about the company and our risk by country is we're always saying, you know, you. You know, look in the U.S. We're exposed, you know, to whatever happens in the U.S. because, you know, the dominance of our business there. But you you look at all of the other countries and say, let's make sure that we're balanced and we've thought through and who we do business with, how we do business, the amount of exposure we take, and you're you're thinking about all that. And so with our board and our, you know, we have country limits and industry limits, and you you look at them. You're not going to get 
you're not going to say, I'm going to exit this country on this day and I'm going to be right because right. it's never that predictable. But what you want to do is if something happened, Russia invades Ukraine, we're able to get out of our Russia small business there and not have to look back. But we started that in 2014 after Crimea when the probability of something, uh, a severing of Russia from the Western world was getting higher. You know, when you've talked quite a bit about Russia, Ukraine, does it concern you at all? That the, that the key variable isn't what the Ukrainians do on the battlefield or even what the Russians do on the battlefield, but in, it's, it's Western support. And that actually, when you think about the amount of money we spend uh, on the war and on foreign, you know, on foreign aid in, in general, it's actually quite de minimis. And to your point, we're letting somebody else go and do the fight in right. a way uh, who's willing to do right. that fight. I mean, does it concern you that we actually, that what the ramifications would be if they were to suddenly get caught off and don't have the means to even hold right. the line. Well, so that's the interesting thing in, in about President Zelensky and his major aides, so to speak, major ministers. They've been making that pitch ever since. We yep. just need the money. We just need the munitions. Uh, and you know, the, and you could, there's articles out there, and your, your colleagues can read them easily. But you know, the, the question: Are they even making enough stuff to keep? You know, and, and those are things that that are challenging. Um, but this is why you always have to be careful. If you thought about where we were just after it happened a couple of years ago, it was, oh my gosh, you know, grain prices are going to go through the roof. Well, they were able to keep the channels open and right. therefore you know, the Ukraine economy is actually growing. And, you know, and you know, fertilizer prices were going to go through the roof and all, you know, no, no farmer is going to be able to, get, oh, well, maybe it wasn't so. So the world has the way, has to configure things out. It's just the shock of having to figure them out sometimes takes time. but. Yeah, so I think it's pretty amazing, but the case is pretty straightforward that Ukraine makes us. We just give us the money and the munitions, and you know, basically, and we'll fight the war. And you know, and the congressional delegation was there to reassure, you know, reassure them. And we've got to get that work done, and it's going through Congress. And they got to make a decision, but they should, you know, in the end of the day, we need to support him because he's actually doing what needs to be done to neutralize this this uh, challenge. So you pointed out that as the head of a financial institution, that the your, your day job requires yeah. that you think about what's the impact of all of this yeah. on the um, on the economy. So let's talk about the yeah. economy a little bit. And for the benefit of our audience, we're recording this on February first. Recent economic data has continued to be very positive with benign inflation. The Fed just held rates um, uh, yesterday's FOMC meeting. You've been pretty consistent throughout the throughout these last couple of years about uh, the strength and resilience of the American economy. And now it seems like everybody's kind of catching up with you and, yeah. you know, um, maybe not a soft landing, maybe no landing whatsoever yeah. in a sense. But what's your what's your view of where we kind of are right now and what you see for the rest of the year? So so if you go back and think about the last from the pandemic to now, if, if the pandemic happened, you had, a, I think it was 30 percent annualized GDP drop of that quarter or something like that. And then yeah. You, you had to fix that. So a bunch of money came in to fix that, you know, PPP, blah, 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 unemployment benefits, all this stuff. So all that came in. Um, and then you travel along and things start to normalize and meaning stuff. We got vaccines and learned what the pandemic, it was what the causes were and how it spread. You just learned a lot very fast. Uh, and then so things started to open and the economy kept coming back. And we kept putting money on it as if the problem there. So that created inflation, way too much financial st fiscal stimulus, and frankly, probably too long on the rate structure, holding it down for too long all the way into uh, 22. And that then inflation took off. And then they had to really pull it back. And so one of the fastest rate increases in history um, and you know, hits, hits, hits the system. But it's been amazing that because the consumers had money and because they're employed and because final demand you know, went down dramatically, came up and is back on a plane, you, you're running unemployment at you know, three and a half to four. And you know, a year and a half ago, when people said, we're going to hit a recession, I said, well, what's your unemployment projection? They'd say 4.1. I'd say, so we're going to have a recession and we're not going to have unemployment. That, right. that doesn't make sense. Right. So, and then you'd see the consumers, they're employed, they had money, they had stimulus money, stone accounts, they were spending you know, we're spending higher rates and it was growing at double digits. And so, but all that changed uh, towards the end of summer in 23, when the consumer started slowing down, which meant the fiscal, the financial drag, higher interest rates, the wage growth started to slow down, inflation started to take a bigger bite. Um, and the consumer started to worry about the future and they slowed down. And so what happened is you went from 10% year over year, first quarter of 23 versus 22 to about 5% 
fourth quarter of 23 or fourth quarter of 20, and you're running four-ish percent, three-ish percent now, which means it's really slowed down. Now the question flips the other side, which is we have a soft landing predicted, 1% growth this quarter, 1% growth next quarter, one and a half, one and a half for the four quarters of the year. But the reality is, is that the, the consumer activity slowed down enough that now they have to start to say we need to, we need to take the restrictions of the economy down. And that's, yeah, that's a debate about when to go low rates. We have them lowering rates four times this year in the U.S. Um, and four times next year, which is higher for longer because that's a Fed funds rate. So it's three and a quarter, three and a half versus what we're used to for the last 15 years, except for the very narrow time in 18 and 17, 18, 19. And they were already cutting rates in 19, frankly. People forget that second without right. the pandemic even been known. Um, you know, if you think about this, we haven't seen this. Uh, that's not a high rate environment. That is much more of a low to normal rate environment. It's just we haven't been there for so long because we never got out of the ditch of the financial crisis. We never saw inflation. So the Fed's got to at some point start to take the real rate cost down. And as you do that, you've got to use your judgment not to restart inflation and everything else. Meanwhile, around the world, the U.S. consumers solid and strong, but slow their rate of growth, and that's what you got to pay attention to because that drives a lot of the final. Rate. And if you look at Europe, it's bumping along, and we have it a half percent growth for the year or something like that, which you know maybe the maybe gets up to percent, but it's not robust. Their consumers are employed. Tourism has kept a lot of people. It's it's all good, but you can tip that over, and that's where the central banks have to sort of. Get, get rates more normalized and get out of the way and let the private sector and private industry and spending and stuff take over and let the economy normalize. It has not been there for a number of years because of COVID. And even frankly, right. they barely got it there around the world before the pandemic hit from the financial crisis. Now, as, a, as the head of Bank of America, not only are you moving with the financial elite of the world, but you've got an extraordinary line of sight into the consumer in this country through the consumer and, and retail bank and the like. So I feel like the answer to this question is kind of embedded in what you just said, but you're talking about an, an economic picture that is much better than what people have been fearing not yeah. that long ago. But we see this very negative consumer sentiment on the yeah. part of the electorate. And why do you think there is that disconnect I, in your sense? I am... I always am a little bit uh, skeptical about sentiment because mm -hmm. that's an on the couch thing. What are they doing? They're spending more exactly. money this year than last yeah. year. They are, you know, buying stuff still at a faster uh, the growth rate. Slow down, but still growing. Um, they're employed. They're making more money. It's um, inflation bothers them, and that leads to that some of that sentiment. But in fact, multi-year wage growth over inflation has actually been a positive number. So we'll, inflation is tough on certain segments. Kind of certain segments, people entered it. We're now four years away from the pandemic and two years away from coming to three, you know, three years now away from the last stimulus payment. So people who have entered the workforce and never got that stuff. And so they're yeah. like, wait a second, these people, you know, people have stemmed. I didn't get it because I was 15 years, 17 years old. Now I'm 19 or 20. So, you know, there's elements of this that we got to be careful of. But I, I think overall, the consumer slowed down. And this is where you got to take care that they don't overshoot because once you get that consumer really pessimistic, things happen. Now, with the stock market being up, everybody, you know, uh, retail trading volumes pick up. Everybody feels better. And so, you know, there's a lot of this correlates to each other. I wouldn't necessarily take the feeling because the consumer confidence numbers actually have risen when they're doing the right. uh, Michigan survey and stuff back up a little bit. I wouldn't take the on the couch. Do I feel good about America? Because in election year, there's all this noise. I take what they do. I don't, you know, I never... We, even for our own customers, we, we do polls and everything. But what we really do is, what do they do? If they stay, yeah. if our attrition rate's two percent, they must like us. Yeah. You know, if our employee attrition rate's down to six percent, which is the lowest it's ever been, the employees must be satisfied. You, know, you can, you can take the survey, and yes, the scores are strong. But if they're not leaving, or the customers not leaving, and the customers spending, and the customers paying their loans on time, and credit's good, you're sort of saying they got to be in pretty good shape. So I, I don't know how to square it, but I'm just saying I'd be careful yeah. about interpreting one over the other. Got it. And I understand. Yeah. Did, what what concerns you about the picture that you've just painted? That when you, I mean, you, you've talked about yeah. things like the Red Sea shipping situation. We saw, we saw the first, um, you know, oil products yeah. tanker get yeah. hit, for instance, yeah. the other day. Oil's now, you know, back up over eighty dollars a yeah. barrel and the like. But you know, do you see? potential for inflation to re-rear its head or, you know, start moving in the wrong direction again, and that causes yeah. the Fed to pause or? Well, they already paused. It would cause a, them to hold at this level yeah, longer. Yeah, yeah. And, and pause so, the, the easing yeah. cycle longer, let's put it that well, way. They yeah. Yeah, so the, the reality is, is that you have to worry about that. But if you look across the consumer base of Bank of America, 60-odd million consumers, we track their spending on a weekly basis. 
you know, across all different devices, credit cards, debit cards, you know, Zelle payments, you pick your thing. So we track all that, um, four and a half trillion dollars a year. As I said, you know, 2021 to 22 grows at 10%, 22 to 23 starts off at 10, gets down to five, and now growing sub five. So it's slowed down. So that's what you got to track is what they're doing. But if you look at what they spend on gas, it's only 7%. Yeah. So, so, and that's, but the problem is that's, that number can be different by household uh, income. And so there's a bigger burden on certain people than other people. But in the aggregate, you know, it's, it's, it's only 7% of their debit and credit card spend actually, which is 25% of all their money put in the economy. So even with that, it's, you know, it, it's a manageable thing for society writ large, but not necessarily for the people below median income. And that's why you have to be careful about generalization. So if you think about our, our consumers, they can spend through it, but it does change what they spend on. So if you look over history, uh, it, it, the dynamics can change, but the people go spend $40 at the gas station. When gas is $30, they took $10 and they went and bought stuff. When the gas was $40, they didn't buy the stuff. Right. You know, or they started putting $20 in gas. And cause and so you can see those activities. You're not seeing that now. They're, right. The people are kind of normal activity. Got it, got it. So, so let's step back for one second and look at the bigger, bigger picture here. You've talked about what happened during pandemic. And one of the hallmarks of pandemic, not just in the United States, but everywhere, government came back in a very, very significant sure. way. And that has manifested itself now in some, in some new ways. And I just wonder, when you look at um, economic and economic potential, right. right? When you look at things like the IRA and the CHIPS Act and, 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 um, uh, and, and the various stimulative measures that we've taken, plus increased tariff regimes, yes. um, export controls, um, these things that are sort of geopolitically linked, if you will, um, investment restrictions and the like, as well as the kind of the shenanigans of Washington, right? The, these debt ceiling uh, arguments yeah. or just punting continuing yeah. resolutions down the, uh, down the road rather than a comprehensive budget process and, and the like. How much is, is government yeah. problem versus, uh, versus an interestingly yeah. positive variable in economic growth potential right now? The, so it, it, there's a lot of different things. There's regulation, there's you know, uh, debt levels, there's negotiation. At the end of the day, we've, we've got to start paying attention, not only in this country, around the world, to debt levels. Um, as a percentage of GDP, if you get some people who are just raw debt levels, you can have people argue about it. But everybody says, wait a second, we can't run structural $2 trillion plus yeah. a trillion dollars plus debt, debt every year because, you know, that's, so we need to start to think about how to, you know, change the curves around. So more revenue, you know, less spent expenditures, some combination of both, but you got to start to bend that curve out in the future. And, and, you know, people recognize it, but every, you can admire the problem, you can do something. So we need to get after that. Um, because in fact, the economy grows so fast nominally that basically the size of the debt got sort of deflated away and inflated away as a percentage. And now we got to be careful because if inflation slows down, that, that dynamic doesn't happen anymore. So we got that. And, but I think if you're talking more about act, when you think about things that had to happen. So in COVID, you had to figure out a way to preserve the economic activity, given that you ordered people not to be open. That's that simple. So what you do, you basically try to alleviate the burden of that. So Enterprises are open and up, not going to help you. But if you are a restaurant shut down, we're going to try to with payroll protection and you know uh, the loans and all that stuff. Or try to keep it alive. I mean, so that was all great thought process. The question is that, but you then you got to back out and let you know the free market take over again. And so I think that that's where I get worried. And and so then you have to flip to the modern thing, which is look. The thing we learned in the pandemic was the supply chains were much too narrow. Sure. So the the work the corporate world had done to just drive efficiency, which benefited the corporate con world's consumers a lot. Drive efficiency of supply chain to you know to, to a little bit to a little bit imbalance resiliency versus supply. We got a asset test in. And by the way, in the Russia Ukraine situation, Germany got that in the energy supply. And so a lot of these are actually supply and variability of supply. And so you know, so that we learned a lesson. So that's going on. And so people sometimes take this trade tariff and stuff is being, it's really about, wait a second, I've got to, I've got to diversify my supply chain, not from geo, not only from geopolitical, which would be obvious tariffs and things like that, trade war, but I've got it just from sickness, fire, right. flood, you know, right. I can't lose right. the only source of whatever for a substantial period of time. And, and that we learned a lot about. So that's what's going on beyond that. Plus then 
the geopolitical scene adds to it. So you're seeing, you know, it, it, where people use all the fancy words of coupling this, that, deglobalization stuff. But at the end of the day, the glo when you talk to global companies, they're looking at market opportunities everywhere. They have people everywhere. They have factories everywhere. They're producing goods everywhere. They're trying to find final demand everywhere. They see great hope in places like India because it's opening up at the same time. They may not be happy with what's going on in another country. They see great uh, opportunities in Africa of certain consequences uh, because of size of population, but it's you know, trying to get it started. So there's you know, all this is going on, but what they want is stability. And right. what right now is you're seeing instability. There's too much. The second thing is you got to be careful because in the day, if you're trying to deal with society's big problems, if you're trying to deal with the just transition environment, the private sector is the only way it's going to happen. The governments don't have the money. Uh, the charities are wonderful things, but they only have about, a, they give a trillion and a half a year. You need multiples of that to do that. What is better than to have all the expense bases of the world trying to help this transition happen just the right way? Right. Because you got the brains to do it, you got the, uh, you got the money to do it, you got the time to do it, you got the commitment to do it. And that's where governments have to be careful because they can over engineer outcomes that just don't contribute and they got to let the markets go and they got to aid where they can. Enablement, uh, permitting, they got to get things enabled so they can, you know, if we're struggling 10 years to build windmills in a lot of places, you know, you know that's not good because you want them to go up faster and the projects then die on the vine because they can't get financed fast enough. If you want to create, you know, SAF facilities, you got to be aggressive about permitting sustainable aviation fuel facilities. If you want to create, you know, ability to do carbon capture storage, you're going to have to have the pipelines get built to do it. So, you know, th these are trade-offs you have to make if you want the just transition to happen at the pace you could. Or you can have it less. And that's where governments have to figure out the policy let, and less about being the active participant. And I think you, you, your question kind of builds this question, did governments become too active in the thing? And the answer is, yeah, but they had to. The question is now they got to back out and let, the, let enable the private sector and curb, curb them when they're off course. Right. So everything that you've just talked about is, is an element of, you know, whatever buzzword you want to choose, yeah. deglobalization or what have you, but whatever it is, is we're moving to a slightly different yeah. global operating environment than the one that when you inherited the, the, yeah. the reins of the company, you probably thought we were, we were heading into or, or was going to uh, persist over time. Yeah. But in addition to these imperatives because of the pandemic and the, the revealed um, you know, vulnerabilities of the supply chain yeah. and whatnot, what we can't deny also that there is a geopolitical element yeah. that is that is driving this as as, as well, um, and so you know I'm wondering what you think on on that front, particularly yeah. on the U.S. China front, because you know you made the point at the very yeah. beginning that China was represented in a really big way yeah. at Davos this year. It also is lost on nobody, to your point, the United States and a lot of the other. Western economies bounced back in a you know in a big way off of when when we came out of pandemic lockdown. Yeah. China comes out of pandemic lockdown and doesn't have right. anywhere near that kind of bounce, which sort of suggests that the resiliency of this entrepreneurial system with a regulated free market and so on, there's something yeah. to that. Um, but how do you see this this sort of geoeconomic geostrategic you know, competition? It, 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 you know, in the end of the day, I think. Business would like to have the ability to sell products to all anybody that was capable of buying them. Um, and sometimes that's you know takes a certain amount of affluence in society. Sometimes doesn't. Depends on the product. They want they are willing to compete for that market. They're willing to go to war, war um, you know strategically for that market, economically for that market, price wise for that market. But and, and so that's why they don't like tariffs and things like that because that seems to favor domestic suppliers and and, and so the. You know, around the IRA Act, Europe thinks it was a trade barrier put up. And you, you can find people who would say, wait a second, Europe has a lot of this stuff. So around the CHIPS Act, well, that was another trade barrier. Well, Germany had done a trips, CHIPS deal faster than anybody else. So that's the kind of skirmishing that goes on in the world. But what businesses want is access to markets and fair access to markets and fair access to make development. It, on the receiving side of that, you know, the countries need the capital. And the capital is in you know, big pockets in the world. And so to be inviting to capital, you have to have a standardization rules and understanding how to get money in and out. And that sometimes runs counter to local interests. And that's one of the concerns in some of these countries is they're putting up barriers to invest. Even some of it might be protectionist for local uh, 
participants. Other of it's just because they want to slow down the control of their economy by third parties. So yeah. all that's not good. And you know, so India over the last few years, as India's grown best of any, the you know, sort of mid-sized economies are growing. They have been taking those barriers down. They're still there, but they're down a lot lower. So you could own 20% of a company, now you own 50% of a company, now you can own the whole thing. And so that's why it's a, you know, people are looking and say, hey, there's a big populations growing. But at the same time, China obviously put more restrictions on their own companies and on outside companies. And that's what the premier at Davos was basically saying is that don't we wait we understand that we're trying to get this all sorted out I think I could completely remove um, that from the strategic dialogue which about the chips or the AI chip you know the AI chips or you know, uh, things like that and that that I think is a different thing which really doesn't affect 90 percent of the economy 95 percent but it really is important to certain segments of the economy but 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 that's that's different military supplies things that can end up in military supplies and it, countries are right we say I have to control my military output because if we're gonna in our in the, in the United States want to have the strongest military we want to develop and do all this research and we want to keep it we don't want it to leak out so there that I think you have to put over here but this idea of restrictions on investments free flow of capital none of that is really good for the economies but you can understand that, and that's what we're going through now, which is a lot of that's being thrown up as, as ways to tilt the playing field. And, and, and you know, businesses are saying, don't do that because we could do so, you know, we can do so much for your country if you let us put our capital and we know that it can be applied, get a return, get back out if we decide that the rules are clear, that we can compete. You know, we're not asking to win, we're just asking to compete, and we'll win because we're good. Do you think that, um, I mean, there, there are very few bipartisan issues in Washington, but one of them is China. Right. Uh, and, and there's not a whole lot of daylight between yeah. Trump policy and Biden policy right. on China. How important is a strong, robust, participatory Chinese economy? I mean, they, they were the, the growth engine uh, of the last 25 years, and they help bring keep inflation low yeah, around right. the world. Well, it is important for the two largest economies and superpowers and all the other words you want to describe, the U.S. and China, to have a good relationship. Not, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be competitive. And by the way, they say, and that's, and so the encouraging thing about the premier being in, in Davos is he's there to tell the world. We, we know that we have to have a uh, a relationship that works for, the, for us and for the world with the United States, and likewise, we understand the United States. Now, that's why you've seen a lot of trips. So the policy is not that much different, but you're seeing the engagement level pick up because I think, quite frankly, the, the dynamics of the Chinese economy are dictating, hey, we've got to get this thing in, in shape lest we lose a lot of economic activity because we've made it hard enough that companies start moving it out or they're being told to move it out for the uh, for the strategic reasons. And so I think that recognition's happening and, and that's a good thing because it w you know for many years under the last you know the last three administrations this was going in places yeah. that was not good. And so that's a good thing. But hopefully it will continue because you need the military to be in contact, you need the, the secretary of state to be in contact, you need people to be talking to each other and and you see that starting to take hold more and hopefully that continues. Yeah, I agree. Do you think that um, you know it, it, we obviously have the political variability in this country. Administration goes back and forth. But if countries are kind of referring, uh, reverting to their co respective corners, in your industry, highly regulated as an example, I mean, what does this mean for, you know, overregulation or, you know, not consistent regulation? I mean, is it creating a, a complicating dynamic for so you? So I, I think a, a great example to demonstrate the reality is, is in 2007, 2006, yeah. what did we all believe? That the EU economy was going to outgrow the United States. They're within 10% of each size. There was also statements about the Chinese economy, but the EU economy is actually that big. And so the feeling yeah. was they were going to catch us because they, they built the block, they built the trade block, they built the consolidate, and it was going to catch us, the EU zone or the kind of whatever you want. Fast forward to now, and it's about 30% different. That is in part because of, through the financial crisis and out the other side, the capital markets union, which is the United States, the ability for capital to move, the ability for people to raise capital and fix their problems and get on with life, the ability to liquidate people and put it back in the hands of productive things, the ability for the government to cause things to happen and get out of the way and let the private sector do, the ability to have workforce flexibility and redeployment, all those things happen in the United States, and yeah. we had it. So what's Europe missing? They're missing the combined capital markets, and you're hearing more discussion about this. It's been, the debate's been going on for years, but you're hearing certain people 
uh, if the French and others saying, we got to get this done, and they do need to get it done. Because in the end of the day, until you have capital pools that are big enough to support your economy domestically, it's all going to come from the outside. And that then puts you, you know, people like your economies, don't like your economies, and it goes in and out. And so I think you know, that simple demonstration shows that a free flow of capital allows a country to move faster through a crisis and out the other side, allows capital to reform, uses people's savings to create, as opposed to interest rate carries, create equity investments and return and risk taking and growth, you know, that's what's going on. And that you see that happen here. And remember that. So what happened was they came out and they took a different approach to the regulation after they took it. And by the way, our regulations are actually tougher on, especially on larger banks in Europe by a lot. It's not close with the gold plating yeah, and right. all the technical stuff we'd have to get. But the reality is that because they just left so much uncertainty and wouldn't let the banks combine, wouldn't create the common capital markets, they didn't get the bounce back. And they're still struggling for that. And then the pandemic hits and starts down another road. And so I think they need to do that. They know it. It's just at some point you got to have the will to push it through. So I want to pivot here just for uh, for a moment um, to something you brought up at the very top of the call, which was artificial intelligence yeah. and AI. And there's no greater buzzword in the uh, in the world right now. But and that could be a topic of, a, of an entire program unto itself. So let's focus on on AI and Bank of America or AI and the financial services industry. Like, how are you? and the bank employing AI now? Where do you see it kind of going here in the near future? But specific to the industry, what concerns you about it? Or where do you kind of want right. to push the brakes a little bit? So so let's talk first about where we deploy it and what we do. So um, the idea of having you type a query and get back an answer, which takes your query and predicts what the answer should be, which was the early ver it was a yeah. version of chat GPT. We've been yeah. doing that with a thing called Erica for many years. So mm -hmm. it's 18 million customers, 180, 90 million times uh, last quarter, used it, you know, typed an inquiry, got an answer back. That answer is, you know, our policies and procedures and our you know operating right. manuals and stuff doing it, but it's interactive, you know. Yep. Where's where can I how do I how do I get a new set of checks? How do I do this? Very straightforward stuff. So I, and it works. You know, it saves 180 million emails, calls, and stuff. So exactly. think about the dynamics. Yeah. That started 10 plus years ago by first developing a language for financial services that you could then run predictive models to figure out what the next answer is. So sure. You had to build models. Then you had to build the data to touch it because 110 systems are behind our mobile banking system. Then you had to build the pipe to move it around fast because I'm not going to wait 10 minutes for the answer. And so all this, and that's so we learn and we agree with it. But all those things are actually hard to do. And yeah. so now the question is, how do you go apply those when you're saying, oh, they'll take all the enterprise data, let it run on this big system. And so you're not going to see that happen. Now, in just a short year, you've seen the move from, oh, just take this model and it'll answer any question. Well, it hallucinates. Well, it you know, goes in the wrong direction. It just keeps going that you know, well, you read a story the other day. You know, well, it started answering people, then it started swearing at them. You know, it was all this kind of stuff. The question is, okay, now we got to control it. And so the view is in the financial service industry, we have people's you know, financial things. You have to have a control. That means you have to have the data. You have to have how the model is going to work. Now, what are the AI companies saying? Hey, let's take our model, put it on your data, in your environment, and let it train so it can start to do it. So where do we see big opportunities? We see big opportunities already in client service. We see big opportunities in, uh, in programming because... It's already been working for years in programming. It takes years to, for it to be, be learning. So the, the GitHub and ChatGPT Chat and stuff, we're using that. We see it uh, big in helping people uh, build a, a credit offering memorandum, all this work we have to do, helping them figure out faster. We've taken Eric and put it in our GTS, which is a whole different set of customers using it. So we're seeing all these areas we think it has promise. Um, also, you know, some ways you know, checking filings and things like that. We send all, you know, all these financial reports out so we can have those checked by an arch, just, just looking around saying this doesn't look right. Yeah. And that saves time and effort and gives you a second check. So are you going to use done right loans? We've been out writing loans with automated models for years and years and years, but we know how the models make a decision. Can you flip to where you don't know how to model? That's going to be tough for, for people right. to take. And so if I, if I tell you, if I give you a bad answer about, you know, the height of the Empire State Building. Okay, does life depend? No, if I give you a bad answer and turn down your home loan, that's a life-changing sure. experience. So you have to be very careful. And so the AI companies are realizing that this is what do it. So they're coming to us and say, hey, we can build more specialized applications. We can put up more, take our learning, our capabilities, your data, our learning, 
protect it so it doesn't get outside, doesn't exfiltrate data. Let's, and so that's great hope, but that's still down the road. And so th this, this will keep coming at us and coming at us, but it's not something that is foreign to us. We've already been doing it in a form which is not near what it will be, but we're already seeing it play out. And, and yet it's a, there's also cultural and human being change. You know, the programmers that used to love to write code yeah. are saying, this thing's writing the code for me. This isn't as interesting a job as I used to have. So right. we've got to get them culturally to take the same pride they had in solving a real tough problem with a code right to solving a let, let the code work be done and then uh, checking and figure out how to integrate it and do other things. That's, you know, and that's, but that's a cultural change. That's right. what I do every day. I, I like doing that. That's why, sure. I, that's why yeah. I do this. Yeah. You know, yeah. Now you're making me do that. I don't like that so much. Now how do we get that change? So there's a lot of work that has to go on. I want to spend the last part of our conversation talking about leadership, yeah. um, yours specifically. But yeah. before I do, you mentioned at the beginning that you met uh, President Zelensky yeah. uh, in Davos. And, you know, sometimes countries get lucky. They get the leader that they need in the moment that they need them. Yeah. Maybe he won't be the leader that they need when the war is over and they reconstruct and so on. But for, for the moment, yeah. he was the right guy. What was your impression of him? Well, the, the clear mindedness he has, he has to do two things at once. He has to fight the war, win the war, and that is, you know, emotionally draining, you know, a, a way that we really probably can't. Personally stand. dangerous. Yeah. Personally. But then he also has to re rebuild the country, which had corruption issues, which had, and if you saw just the other day, they had to deal with a corruption issue. So he's trying to put a, a set of reforms and all this stuff going on. So he's actually restructuring an economy at the same time he's trying to win a war. It, it, you know, and that, that shows you that a good leader has to walk and chew gum. They have to figure out how to do two things at once. Well, the world's focused on nothing but the war effort. Right. The reality is if he doesn't reform the country, there's going to be no rebuilding going on because Precisely. nobody's going to put capital in to have it disappear. And so he knows he's got to have that. If he really wants West, you know, uh, nations from around the world to put their money online and, and help rebuild the place and or help even during the time of war to keep other, you know, the economy and all these other things going. He's got to have reforms. And so that's a great leader who can sit there and say, yeah, I got a near term problem. I got a, another problem. And I can't wait to the first one solved to get the second one. Um, and, you know, you can't think of a leader who's defining with more sort of, you know, you know completely binary outcomes. You win the war, you don't. Yeah. You, know, you get the reforms, you don't. And, and it's a tightrope of high order and everybody's watching. And yeah. so so I think and then meanwhile, he has to be a great you know, advocate for his position. He has to be out there you know, basically working. So it's an interesting thing. I think he's been very effective. I think he's, uh, but he's balanced. I mean, he's, 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 you see him everywhere. I it did a Reuters thing and he was on right after, right before me. I saw him there. You see him here. You see, you know, uh, my colleague Bernie Menza went to Kiev on Friday the 12th and he, he was there to receive the, uh, Penny Pritzker and a small group of CEOs. I right. mean, he, he is putting his effort in across all fronts, which no you, question. you wonder if he'll wear himself out, but he's doing, you know, but it is the leader for a time. Now, when it comes to you, everybody I ever talked to who, who interacts with you every day, will always talk about how you have this absolutely incredible grasp for detail okay. with this incredibly complex organization with a flood of data coming in all day, every day. How do you, how do you manage that? How do you okay. address the trying to find the signal yeah. in the noise? And how do you, how do you consistently test your own theories yeah. that, are, that, are, that are behind your strategies and how do you remain nimble in that? We, you know, the, the principal, it, one is I, I've worked in all parts of the com company and I've learned a lot from a lot of smart people. I have a great team and they do it and we, we collectively work on things. But, you know, how do you test your strategies? You just got to realize that, you know, you, you have to use outsiders. You have to bring in outside information, bring in outside people, study it. So the fintech explosion happens, you know, and you could have said, ah, these companies are going to have a problem. And, and a lot of them did. And it was predictable. But on the other hand, what, what was the appeal of the customer? And so that's what you had to figure out. Why could the, why would millions of people sign up for something that didn't seem to make sense to anybody else? Yeah. And the end of it, but something was appealing. Mm -hmm. So you have to be willing to always say, we're probably not right. You have to have a he healthy amount of self-doubt, a healthy amount of uh, criticality. You have to be confident. You have to make good decisions. You have to live up with them and push. You have to be consistent. You have to communicate. You have to have a theory, a set of principles. But you also have to sit there and say, what if we're wrong? How could it go wrong? What could do it? And that's the balance you have with a good manager team is they're, they're willing to say, you know, we're going to run consumer this way because we're very good at it. We're more efficient than anybody. Our customers like us anybody. Our attrition is lower than anybody. We're growing organically very fast. That's all great. But what aren't we doing? 
and how do we think about you know new ways to think about you know an air rate uh, that is beyond any pale of any company that's ever existed and think about our company in a difference in a different setting a manufacturer of millions of units of X but it's services not goods but right. we have to have the same precision to it and so how do you, and so those so you always have to be looking and reading and learning and listening so when I listen to AI I learn a lot when I go to you know this place you always listen to other CEOs and other companies and other people and other businesses saying and how do we import that that healthy self doubt is critical now I'm lucky because we have this big research group that writes yeah. on all these companies and you know and they do Candace Brownie and team do a good job so they, they give us tremendous information so when we want to talk about fintechs we have the people come in or cover those companies and they're saying this is the best company in the world and here's the good stuff you're doing so okay we may not agree with you but at least we understand why you think that and that's important because that means capital flow into them and what happens so my final question for you is you know talk about listening to other ceos there's something very unique about the banking and financial services industry and that's the longevity of ceos you've been there what 15 years Jamie Dimon's been there for 20 years. James Gorman just left after he was at, started in 2010 as well. Larry Fink's been around for 30 plus years. What what what, what explains that? Is that is, is and, and because the average CEO in the Fortune 100 is like a NFL linebacker, like about four seasons, yeah. something like that. Should that be longer to see through these strategic initiatives? And I guess yeah. lastly, if a new if one of your customers got a new CEO in this in this environment of kind of great uncertainty and was just starting out in that role, what would you, what would you, what would you tell them if they asked for advice? Well, so on the new CEO, you know, I, I do talk to a lot of people who just become CEOs and because you meet them as clients exactly. and they actually right. call you up and say, and you're, you're saying, you know, you have to think you're in a different job than you've ever been in because you have all the, Accountability and another responsibility. Other people run the business. Other people run the risk fund. What, what, you know, you, but you, ha you have to make sure it all happens. And, and so you've got to go to that job. And a lot of the things really changing what you do, how you do it, how thoughtful you have to be, how you have time management. And by the way, you're not going to get it right because you're going to have you know, the old saying, half, you're going to spend half your time on this, 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 and you're 200% of your time. So it's never going to quite work out. But you have to Think about all the constituencies, and there's certain things that only you can do. You know, it's certain representation in the outside world, whether it's uh, with politicians or other types of people, with certain clients, with certain uh, with media and other things. You, have, you know, they're looking for you. They're not looking for somebody else. And so, you so the CEO job instantly moves you into a place that's hard to do. It. And there's no buck, and your bosses are a board of directors who are there to govern you and you're there to translate the activity. So you need a great board, you need a board that understands a company, you need a board that is willing to back it. And I think that then leads to why I think bank CEOs have been there longer is that, you know, a lot of us had to rebuild after the financial crisis, yeah. all of us did, all of us did. And then, you know, we all grew up in a time frame, and, and we were all relatively young when we got appointed, so we could do it physically, because it's a physical. But, you know, and I think the consistency of the strategy has been helpful. And because we aren't doing deals and buying things, you know, it's basically we've been all organically driven. The yeah. big so you just had to sit how to do this day after day. And so that's led to longer longevity because, you know, people, if people are buying companies and mergers take place, CEOs go, CEOs come. If people because there's a lot of other things that happen. Um, and then I think, you know, but, but part of it is banks need a duration of, of, of leadership. And, and so, you know, it's been it's been good and yet yeah, you could look at it and say for the first five years we were digging out holes but the whole time we were driving organic growth initiatives at the same time going back to never put myself in the Zelensky category but the thought that we were walking and chewing gum we were taking care of the mortgage crisis the financial crisis and all that stuff at the same time we were driving massive change in investment technology that sets us up for where we are today so you know so Erica started in like 2000 you know 15 we started working I think it came out it came into the market in 17 or 18 yeah, in a time when you were fighting for expenses to you know, put the money in to do that, you know, so so you had to be doing that, and so I think, but you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you didn't the first five years all you did was fight fires, then you got to be a CEO, and the answer is you were a CEO the whole time, and I think, but I think banking just you know it just lends itself a little bit because the financial crisis was such a cathartic thing, a bunch of people came in, and you know David at Goldman, but Lloyd had a you know the, you know a lot of us bridge from that time right after that time more or less to now. And then, you know, now we're going to get old and we're going to turn it over to really talented teammates and they're going to, going to run these places someday. 
So it should be apparent to everybody on this call, uh, on this program, that um, you're a very optimistic guy. And I just wonder if, you know, with all of the own goals that the United States yeah. shoots for itself and getting our, we're on our worst enemy oftentimes, but we've got a unique ecosystem here, a unique financial ecosystem, entrepreneurship and, and diversity and scale and all that. You're still a bigger, better on the United States than anywhere else. Yeah, and we have businesses all over the world. We I know. practice all over, but in the end of the day, if you're a bank, the size of the economy is going to dictate. We're having a United States uh, bank, but the United States, we have a way of figuring things out, and that that is that is a private sector and capitalism done right. And so we have always struggled with getting capitalism done right. In other words, profits and purpose and all the discussion about. It. But the United States does it. But they believe that you got to make money for shareholders and you got to deliver for society. It's not or. The genius of the end, we call it. Other places get it confused. And other places, you know, frankly, overprescribe the outcome. And that's when you get caught. So it's a, once in a while that thing gets off the rails and you got to push it back on. And that's, but that, the opportunity created for people from education through entrepreneurship, through big companies, in this country is second to none. And that's why everybody wants to come here. It's pretty amazing. And so, you know, and, and we, we need to remember that. And the best, you know, the best sort of thoughts about being an American are often spoken by non-Americans because they see the opportunity, they see what you have. And we just got to remember that. Well, Brian Moynihan, chair of the board and CEO of Bank of America. Thanks so much for being here. It's been a real pl pleasure talking to you today. It's my pleasure. I really uh, I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. That's it for today. Until next time, I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.